Hi, welcome to Distinti's World video number two. This is uh, New Magnetism Part 1, Understanding Magnets and Magnetic Fields. Uh, this is for general audiences. Uh, I'd like to introduce my other cat, Terrence, also known as Terrence the Terrible, or also known as Mr. T. Uh, normally we see little Philip here, but Mr. T decided to come visit us today. Um, if you go to a wiki magnetic field, you can see the classic model for the classic flux line model about a magnet. And they have a north side, a south side, and it looks like a charge. It looks like a charge. And they get this from the fact that they, they dump iron filings over a magnet uh, under, with a piece of paper in between. And this is the formation that the iron filings uh, take. And therefore, they assume that that's the magnetic field. I'm going to show with some simple experiments that this is complete nonsense. So they call it lines of force. Let's look at some other lines of force. Okay, for a gravitational field, if we drop an apple, it falls along the line of force. No matter where you drop the apple, it's going to fall along the lines of force. For electrostatic field, if you have a like charge, it's going to fly away in the direction along the lines of force. Okay, that's where the term lines of force come from. But if these are lines of force, then why aren't the magnetic, the iron filings all like flowing toward one side or the other in the field? They're not. They're static. Okay, so we can be sure that there's a force at work here because they do arrange themselves into a nicely ordered pattern. But because the filings are not moving, this pattern can only be the result of forces that are imbalanced somehow. Now, granted, there is some friction by the paper, but I'll show you that there's a lot more going on uh, with this picture than just the, the friction of the paper. Uh, now the question is, if we go out into nature and we look for another force that can arrange stuff into nicely ordered lines, is there another example? And, and the answer is quite yes. And if we look at the sand on the, on the beach, okay, we see that the sand dunes are aligned in nice little lines. Um, and if we weren't from this planet, and let's say we were on a starship that never ever saw sand dunes before, and we looked at this picture, we'd obviously say that the lines of force travel in this direction, where because we're on this planet, we know that the wind, which is the force that causes this, actually goes in the orthogonal direction. Okay, so we can be easily fooled by what we see. So now, why iron filings <laughs> make this pattern? Come on, guy. <laughs> Come on. Could you please? <laughs> Um, anyway, the question is, well, why does the iron filings make this pattern? Okay, if flux is the energy going from the north side of the magnet to the south side, why aren't the iron filings swept to the south side? Okay, so as we continue, I'm going to show with simple experiments that a five-year-old can do, um, which will demonstrate that the classical flux model, which means flow, actually, is baloney. Uh, and there's actually more detail of this in the Ethereal Mechanics video number 2, 3, and 18. And we're going to have a little bit more detail, in, well, actually a lot more detail in part 3. Um, and, and later we're going to show a simple way to model magnets, so simple even a physicist can do it. And we're going to show how this affects uh, modern scientific thinking about other things, which include the sun and the Earth's magnetic field. In the next video, we're going to show new magnetism techniques for understanding the behavior of non-magnetized objects. Um, this is called the method of images for magnetism. It's similar to the method of images for electrostatic charges. Uh, it'll be the first public release of this technique. So let's explore the lines of force. And let's see what's really going on. And I love this because it looks like they came up with these things called magnetic monopoles. That's a lot more baloney. So let's do the simple bar ball experiment. Okay, this is the bar ball experiment. I got a bunch of disc magnets put together to simulate a bar magnet because I don't have one this big. There's a little pencil holding it up and this or a little bit of an incline. So I'm going to roll a BB uh, from this end. And you can see, okay, well, it goes right to the edge just like the flux diagram, the old flux diagram shows. That's great, great, great. But then this side, because the flux goes this way, it should repel the ball. Oh, no, it attracts it. So now we're going against the lines of force. But now what about at the center where the flux lines are supposed to be going this way? Well, 
Hey, it didn't follow the flux lines. Come on, this is ridiculous. So the ball does not follow the flux model as they have it. Maybe the iron filings do, but the ball certainly doesn't. Okay, returning from the experiment, okay, the ball did not behave according to the lines of force. I mean, maybe physicists should stop fondling their bosons and start playing with their balls. Okay, now we're going to do, if we do a bar bar experiment, I don't have to do the experiment, you guys are familiar with this one. Uh, we observe that the dislike poles, and this symbol of the green barbell shows attraction, that the dislike poles attract, but like poles repel. And that's similar to what electrostatic charges do, and that's why the alchemists out there are searching for magnetic monopoles. But as usual, I'm going to show you that humans have it backwards, and humans always get stuff backwards before they get it right. And when you understand the proper mechanism, you're going to see it's just the opposite, that like attracts like, and dislike repel. Okay, and don't fall for the voodoo explanations. There's a lot of people out there that are going to be adamant and tell you that, well, it's magnets repel because the fields are pushing apart on each other, and they can show you how the iron filings in this area show up. But if that were true, there would be two problems. First, there would be a disconnection, because how does the repulsion of the magnetic field lines out here correlate to a force acting on this magnet over here. Okay, that's a disconnection between action and reaction. In other words, the action and the reaction have to be in the same place. That is rule of acquisition number 19, it disconnect from the disconnected. Okay, and also the behavior of light would be wrong. Our modeling that engineers use using e to the j omega requires that the field components of light add without interfering with each other. They add linearly for our models to work. And so if magnetic fields, you know, and the other thing is, well, I will discuss that later. So in keeping with rule of acquisition 19, the way we have to view this is each magnet generates a magnetic field, or emits a magnetic field, and this one, that's this one. At each point in space, these magnetic fields sum, linearly, and this magnet here reacts to the total magnetic field present in its area, and this magnet reacts to the total magnetic field present in its area, independent of what the other one's doing. Otherwise we'd be violating Newton's third law if you look at video number 14, I believe it is. So let's do the disc ball experiment. If I put the ball on the disc, it's going to go right to the edge. Okay, according to classical theory, the flux lines center concentrate in the center. So, why, when I try to push it toward the center, it's going to go toward the edge? Well, let's explore this. They make an interesting material called MagnaView film. Now, let's put this MagnaView film over the magnet, and you can see the bright ring around the edge. And no matter what I do with this ball, it's going to want to go toward that bright ring. Go into the light. Okay, it's, and this magnet has a little flaw, so I don't. Usually, you can get it anywhere along the edge, but it likes these two edges the best, I guess. Um, and so, what we see here is the edge currents, and we're going to talk about the edge currents next. And the reason why that occurs is because of current rings. If you look at a piece of magnetic material over here. Um, you can look at each magnetic molecule has a, a current running, or an electron running around in a loop. In a magnetic, magnetized material, those loops are all running in the same direction. So where one loop charge is moving this way, the other loop charge is moving the other way, so you have equal and opposite currents. And all in this area here, in the t entire center of the magnet, these current loops cancel each other. So the only thing left are the parts of those loops that are on the outside that forms what looks like a current. And that's why the MagnaView film shows the current, and this is what the MagnaView shows you. For simplicity though, instead of showing you the, the, the uh, arrows running around the outside, I'm going to show you a arrow in the middle which signifies the right hand rule. If the arrow is coming up through the middle, then your current runs around the outside that way. That's called the right hand rule. Mind, sir? Thank you. 
Now, if you have a magnet with a hole in it, okay, then the current on the inside is not uncovered. And so you have current on the outside running this way, but the inside current is going to run the other way. And it's not hard to show that. You can do that on your own. And so we go to new electromagnetism, V3, V4. And what we're going to do, we're not going to explain all these to you, but what we're going to be concerned with here is this term here. This term defines how magnets work with each other. Okay, now it looks like a lot of you know, very complicated stuff, but let me show you in very simple terms what this little term means. This basically says if you have two, these, these lines here are currents, two currents that are moving in a parallel direction, there's going to be attraction between them. This green barbell signifies they're being pulled together. It's like a bungee cord. If the currents are moving in the opposite direction, they're going to be pushed apart. And the arrow, double-ended red arrow, is a symbol for repulsion. This is the fourth term of new electromagnetism. So how do current rings interact? And a simple disk magnet is a, essentially a current ring. Well, if you got the two magnets and they're on the table right side up, Okay, they're going to repel. If you have one up and one down, they're going to attract at the edges. Okay, but because only the edges here are in action, the repulsion is not that hard and the attraction is not that strong because you only have this slight area of the edge that are moving in parallel or in, in, they're in a parallel direction. And so that's why along the place where the current rings are, per, are parallel in this direction, that's why you have a very strong attraction because you have a lot more length of current that's parallel to each other and again on the other, the other way this is why you have a very strong repulsion It's because you have a lot of current that's in parallel. You know, all the entire length of this loop is parallel to the length of this loop and opposite, going the opposite way obviously. And so there's a lot more interaction than just this little part of the edge that's you know, so that's why this is stronger than this. That's why I show three arrows as opposed to one. Okay, this is also why the currents at the outer edge of a magnet, that's why the current at the outer edge of the magnet is concentrated at the edge. Oh, oh shall go to the experiment there. Now if I take a very strong bar magnet, I'm going to show you why the edge current center on the edge. Because if I take a bar magnet, you can see the edge current, a very bright line at the edge of the magnet. Okay, and let's mark that so you can see where that is right now. This edge current looks like it's right about here. Okay, but if I put another magnet next to it, I'm going to be able to pull that edge current. And you'll see it, it's far off the mark. It's moved toward, the edge currents attracted toward each other. I hope you can see that on the camera. So that's why the edge currents attract each other, because like moving currents attract. But just be careful because the actual edge current is a distribution. It's not, you know, for a bar magnet anyway, it's a distribution. It may not look exactly like this. It may look something more like this. Not 100% sure. I haven't really measured it. Uh, but it's not zero at the edges. Okay, and the longer the magnet is, you know, the, and this is a disk magnet because it's a very narrow edge current. Now we're going to show you the disk on disk experiment. Now we're going to do the disk-disk experiment. If I have a disk and I take another smaller disk magnet on a string and I slowly lower it over the other disk, where is it going to go? It should go to the center according to classical theory. But where does it go? Well, it goes right for the edge. I have maximum edge-edge alignment there. I don't know if you can see that in the video, but if I turn this sideways, you see it's right edge for edge. Okay, but what about non-magnetized objects? So 
Now we're going to do the demonstration of non-magnet and magnetic materials. Now what you've got to be careful about is in the magnet world, not all disc magnets have their, ed their currents at the edge. As you can see here, this magnet has got currents running zigzag across the face. These magnets are designed to attach to metal refrigerators and stuff because they have more current density than just the current going around the outside. Okay, and so again, if we put the ball here, we're going to see the ball is going to want the ball bearings want to go right to the edge currents. Well, these are center currents, but I'm going to call them edge currents because they're they're at the edge of the domains. Okay, no problem. So far, so good. Let's take a little disc magnet, a little tiny disc magnet. Put a little tiny disc magnet there. A little disc magnet wants to go toward the edge currents. That way there we got one edge lining here, one edge lining there. If I flip it, you can see it's that's the edge there. Okay, so the little edge currents still want to align. But what happens? What happens when we put a little disc of unmagnetized metal there? Look at that. That lined up in the middle between the edge currents. So you know, but now if I turn it sideways so it's got the profile of the ball, it's going to want to stay in the middle, centered on the edge current. But then again, if I turn it sideways, it's going to want to be between the edge currents. And that'll work with a solid washer. You can, I mean, a solid disc. You don't, the, the hole in the middle doesn't really affect this outcome. And so what we learn from this is that depending on the shape of the non-magnetized object will behave differently to a magnetic field. So just because iron filings behave one way doesn't mean that another shaped powder or substance will behave a completely different way. So we have to be careful what we observe. Okay, and the conclusion is because non-magnetized objects depend on its shape, if it's a non-magnetized, depends on the shape. So it can each shape of non-magnetized object can behave differently to a magnetic field. And therefore there is no such thing as flux lines. Since the shape of an object affects how it responds to the magnetic field, then this picture does not show flux lines. This is just the way iron filings behave in a magnetic field. In the next video we'll discuss non-magnetized objects in a magnetic field and just demonstrate how this pattern actually forms. Again, just because stuff forms into a lines, the effect does not mean that the direction of the cause is parallel to the lines. The actual field mechanism, how do parallel currents attract? What is the mechanism? Well, that's subject of your theorem mechanics. And uh, if you see the intro for part three, which is EMV032, which should be released, released in a couple of days, uh, I'm going to show you how we're going to go forward. Okay, solar prominences. Okay, these are not magnetic field lines. I get, when I watch shows about the sun, I just get all bent out of shape because they're going, oh yeah, these are magnetic field lines. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They ain't magnetic field lines. There's no such thing as fake magnetic field lines. We just demonstrated that. And in fact, if they were the magnetic field lines of classical theory, these would be repelling. Okay, so what these are are electron discharges similar to electron beams or a plasma lamp not quite a plasma lamp a plasma lamp is very slow this is very fast more like an electron beam that you'd see in an old TV set and because the charges are in motion they're going to generate an incredible magnetic field and if I had to show you where the flux lines of classical theory would put those flux lines those flux lines would be going around this way if the current's moving that way but it's more likely that you have charge moving in both directions here. Positive moving one way, negative moving the other, is that's a possibility. Don't know that 100% for sure. But how does this work? Well, what you get is on the surface of the sun, just like what happens in the atmosphere of the earth, somehow charges are separated. Okay, so you have a pool of negative charge that forms over here by some mechanism, and another pool of positive uh, charges form over here. But because they're kind of obscured by the curvature of the sun, they don't really see each other. And so what happens is by repulsion, these things get shot up upward. But as they move upward, these electrons can see and are affected by this positive pool over here. So they get pulled around and they short circuit on the other pool. Uh, but multiple, str multiple streamers are going to form. And because of parallel currents attract, these are going to kind of bundle together. 
Okay, and you can see, again, this photograph of the electron discharge on the surface of the sun compared to a cathode ray uh, electron discharge in a laboratory. Same idea. They bundle together. The reason why these electrons don't fly apart due to Coulomb forces is because it's because they're in motion and parallel currents attract. That's why they do not fly apart for due to Coulomb forces. Same thing here. But now why does this have an orange color? Well, I find out that this is a false color thing from NASA. So if we go to this other website, oh it didn't really come out that great. Um, if you go there you'll see that they have a picture of a solar eclipse where you can see the corona. And this corona is very, very magenta. Well, there's a tinge, little tinge of orange. And if we pass an electron beam through a tube filled of, of uh, hydrogen, we get that magenta color. And if you pass it through a tube filled with helium, you get a, more of an orange color. And so this is mostly hydrogen, maybe with a touch of helium. And if you don't believe me, then ask yourself, well, how does ionized gas, how does one ionize gas using a magnetic field? I don't know of any process. Maybe there's one out there. Okay, and the all known means of generating illumination require charges to flow or be exchanged. Incandescent bulbs, LED bulbs, neon or fluorescent bulbs, um, lighting, oh, lightning, as in cloud to cloud or cloud to ground lightning. Bioluminescence, charge is part of the process. You can go to that link. Glow sticks, northern lights. This is interesting. When I did the research for this, it showed me there's another thing we got wrong. Okay, northern lights. This is ionized particle hitting uh, toward the northern, northern and southern uh, poles of the Earth. And this is the picture that is on Wiki, I believe. It's a picture from NASA. And they show ionized particle. This is the Earth and the magnetic field. And they say the ionized par particles come in and they get deflected along the flux lines of the magnetic field of the Earth. And it's like, you know, it's not, if anything, you could use F equals QV cross B because if you've got the particles moving in and the magnetic field goes down, then the direction of those ionized particles would be around the Earth, not over the Earth. So this would cause positive particles to go this way around the Earth and the negative particles to go the other way around the Earth. And guess what? Those are the Van Allen radiation belts. They acknowledge, in another part of Wiki, that the Van Allen radiation belts are caused by the magnetic field. Okay, where this doesn't sh even come into talking about those. So the only way that you could deflect charges up and around the Earth is because of the Coulomb forces of the Van Allen radiation belts pushing them up and over and around. And the other thing I really, really blows my mind is they show you how the magnetic field is stretched by this stuff. And I'm like, give me a break. If magnetic field lines can be pushed around by electric charges like that, then why doesn't the solar wind uh, bend and obscure observation of light? Because light has a magnetic field component to it. I mean, come on. So, conclusion of this part is the old Savart field model is obsolete. It does not explain all the observations. There's no such thing as magnetic flux lines. There are no magnetic monopoles, and solar prominences are not magnetic field lines. They are electric dis electrical discharges. Okay, next, um, we're going to do some new electromagnetism videos. We're going to go back for one more ethereal mechanics videos while we wait on the new math construct. Uh, in new magnetism part two, we're going to talk about the method of images for how to model a object that is not already magnetized. And then D4, we're going to cover all the other terms of new electromagnetism. And D5, we may talk about this thing I just talked about. I'm not sure I want to bother wasting more time on that. So this is probably not going to occur. Anyway, thank you. No more voodoo physics. Take care.